This video is packed full of all the information needed to recreate any of the elements in this painting. Most of the video is close to real time, with some time lapse in areas requiring less instruction. I really dive deep into each step of my process, and at the end I share with you my favorite varnish and why I use it. With that, let's get started. So the first thing that I did when I was planning this painting was to look at as many reference pictures as I could. I knew what I was looking for because my sister-in-law told me exactly what she wanted. She wanted a super simple nighttime ocean scene with she didn't want any rocks or any cliffs, nothing. All she wanted was a clear night sky. She didn't even want any clouds. So in a way she was making life a little difficult for me trying to figure out what I was going to put in this painting to make it interesting. I had my guidelines, a clear night sky with some pretty waves and some shining wet sand. So with that in mind, I was looking through these reference pictures and what stood out to me most was the light and how it's really captured in some of the pictures, the glow of the moon on the water and how it shines on the sand. So I decided that that's what I really wanted to put in the painting. I started with a really simple basic sketch on a regular piece of paper, a little standard nine by 11. Originally, I put the moon in the center of the composition. It just, I mean, it was fine, but it wasn't super interesting. So I moved it to the left at the one third line, keeping in mind that rule of thirds. If you haven't heard of the rule of thirds before, all it's really simple, it just, means to try to have things that catch interest at each of the one-third lines or like, for example, to not have your horizon line be right in the middle of the painting, to either have it be a little higher or a little lower and, I don't know, it just makes it a little more interesting. So I went ahead and I moved the moon and then I thought, how else can I make this interesting? How can I make it different? My sister-in-law loves the ocean and she loves the water, so I wanted to incorporate as much of the water as I could. So I thought, why not just stretch it out and use a panoramic size canvas? So I tried that out, I thought it looked great. So I went ahead and I transferred that sketch onto my canvas. I sketched it onto my canvas using a graphite pencil. I sprayed the sketch with some workable fixative just to keep the pencil markings from smudging and mixing around with the paint when I started painting. So, sketch in place, it's finally time to start doing some color mixing. My thought process when I was mixing these colors was not really to match any of my reference pictures, but to just have some colors that look nice together that I was happy with and that I liked. Colors that I used for this painting are titanium white, ultramarine blue, thalo blue, thalo green, black, and cadmium yellow. I started off my color mixing by making some various shades of blue for the sky. I wanted to use some dark blues for the sky rather than black or something because the sky is dark, but I didn't want it to be black or dull, so blue it was. I started off by making a really dark blue pile using the ultramarine blue and the phthalo blue and a little bit of black. My goal here was to make the darkest color that I was going to have in the sky. And from there, if I'm mixing the same color, and in this case I was making some different shades of that dark blue, I like to make the other shades of color from that same pile. So I took a little bit of the dark blue mixture and added some white and some ultramarine blue. So here I took some of the dark blue mixture that I made and added some white and some ultramarine blue to make my first lighter shade of blue. Then I took a little bit of that mixture and added some phthalo blue and a bit of black for another blue shade.
color mixing can take a lot of practice and it takes a lot of time. Yeah, it used to be one of the things that I looked forward to the least when starting my paintings just because it can take so long at first because at least for me I had no idea what colors to mix to make the colors that I wanted and anyway it was just frustrating sometimes. Here I have three shades of blue mixed and I went ahead and started mixing up these turquoise colors using the phthalo blue and phthalo green and some white. I made these just to have some variations of color for the sky. After I finished mixing my turquoise colors, I decided I needed one more darker shade of blue for the very darkest parts of the sky. So I went ahead and I mixed a dark blue using ultramarine blue, quite a bit of black, and a small amount of white. Here you can see me add just a small amount of cadmium yellow to some of that uh, titanium white. And this mixture was going to be for the color of my moon. I didn't want the moon to be pure white. And I've just found that it doesn't look quite right when you use any of the colors straight out of the tube. They're just, they're, they're too saturated, too pure of a color, and you don't really find those colors in nature. Now I like my paintings to have colors that are not quite what you're going to see. Like I'm totally okay with having blues that are too bright or too whatever. That's one of the great things about painting is to me is that it doesn't have to look like a picture. It can be whatever you want it to be. But still, even for me, colors straight out of the tube are a little much. After I mixed that yellow there, I went ahead and I mixed some light blue color and then took some of the blue from that light blue and lightened it with a bunch of titanium white and I was thinking that these would be kind of my main colors to create the glow around the moon. All right that's all the colors we need mixed for now so my palette is ready and it's time to start painting. All right so here I am simply just took some of that white yellow mixture that I made to put in the basic shape of the moon up in the sky. I didn't worry about making a perfect circle because I can always move it around when needed, but you know, try to get it as close to what I want it to be, but not stress about it too much. First step after that is to go ahead and paint that light blue color right around the edge of the moon there. When I'm adding in this light color blue around the moon, this is also a really great time to clean up the edges around the outside of the moon before moving on to the next color. little bit darker around that second darkest color that I mixed the second darkest blue and then use a dry blender brush when you're blending it's really important that it's dry otherwise it makes the paint wet and runny and uh, it just does not work well the biggest thing for the glow around the moon is to work in circles because the moon is a circle. So as it's going out, you want that glow to stay in a nice circle pattern, circle shape. So as you can see, I played around a lot with how much light I wanted around the moon. I added some more of that light color 
and blended it outward. That's one of the things that I love about oil paints is how easy it is to change something. Since they stay wet longer than acrylics, I can change or add things even hours from when I start and they're still blendable, still movable. Another thing to mention when you're blending a light color into a darker color should always start with the lighter color and work your way outward. That way you get the nice blend of the light and the dark colors blending together, but you don't darken up that nice light color that you laid down. To keep my blender brush dry when I go back in, I just wipe it off with a paper towel really well. I've tried before to clean it in my little paint thinner can, the way I wash all my brushes when I'm done painting, but it just makes the brush too wet. Even after drying it with a paper towel, it's really hard to get all of that liquid out. When you wash your paintbrush with a paint thinner, it usually takes an hour or so for it to really dry out. So to clean the blender brush in between blending, I just wipe it off really well with a paper towel. Here I'm using my blender brush to push the outline of the moon out from the inside just to kind of clean up the edges a little bit. And then again, the same on the other side. I was just making that circle nice and clean. I mixed a small amount of brown into my moon mixture so that I could add some of these shadows and craters in the moon. happy with that, I went ahead and started blending more of those dark blues out into the sky.
laid down this piece of tape all across the horizon line just so I could get a nice clean line when I was finished painting the sky. It really helps me. It's not necessary, but it does help get a nice straight line as long as you press it down really well so none of the paint sinks underneath the tape. The process for blending all this blue across the sky is pretty simple. Really just painting the blue onto the canvas and blending it until you can no longer see your brush strokes. Other than that, the only thing to note is that the blues get darker as you work your way out towards the edges and the corners of the painting. The reason to save all those darker colors for those edges is because that's where the least amount of light is. And it also, it helps lead the viewer's eye into the painting. When I finished my first pass across the sky, I decided I wanted the whole sky to be a bit lighter. So I went ahead and I redid that whole process with some lighter colors. And the only difference this time was that it was the next day, so the color that I had painted was pretty dry. So really had to work the paint in to the canvas. It was a lot harder to blend the next day.
So here, as I was lightening up the sky, I also took the opportunity to add a little bit of that turquoise color. When we're blending outward in the sky like this, we're no longer focused on making those circles around the moon. Like when we're working on the glow, we want to go in nice circles. Then as we work our way out into the sky, we're going to switch from the circles and we're going to start blending up and down and side to side. This gets rid of the brush marks and gets it nice, even covering across the canvas. We only want the circles around the moon up until where the glow begins to fade out into the sky. The easiest and best way that I have found to create stars is to splatter them across the canvas using a small frayed filbert brush. What I do is I thin out the paint mixture. In this case, I used the light blue that I used around the moon. And I thinned it out with about 40% paint thinner. So I had about 60% paint mixture, 40% thinner. The biggest thing with that paint when you thin it out is that you want it to be thin enough that it comes off the brush easily, but isn't gonna be super runny. All right, so here, what I do is I take the brush with the paint on it, and I tap it along the side of a clean brush, changing the angles and directions as I go to help create some random splatters in the sky. If you'd like to try another method, I've seen some other artists do the same thing, but rather than tapping it on another brush, they flicked the paint off with their finger, I've tried experimenting with that and tapping on a brush works better for me, but do whatever works for you. 
and I was done splattering the stars across the canvas. I used my liner brush to put in some small dots to represent some larger stars, just trying to be random with those as well. Then we finally get to take off the tape. It's always fun. All right, so here I am laying in my horizon line. I use a flat filbert brush, the biggest one that I can have control over. And what I do is I take the paint, which is in this case is that dark blue mixture that I made for the water. It's the darkest point in the ocean, right back there where the line touches the sky. With that dark blue paint on the tip of my brush, I just touch the very top of that tape line where it meets the sky. What I do is I keep my hand locked in place and just move my arm slowly to the right so that I can get that nice straight line. Once I have that nice clean horizon line established, I go ahead and I block in the colors for the rest of the ocean by the horizon line. I have the lightest blue under the moon and slowly get darker with those blues as I work my way to the edges. The biggest thing when putting in the color back by the horizon line is to keep all of the paint strokes horizontal. We're gonna want those strokes to be horizontal up until we get to that first big wave. Once I have the colors in place, I use the same brush and I take some of that lighter blue mixture and put in the effect of some waves moving in the distance. The way I accomplish those is with just a slight rocking motion. You want the rocking motion to be pretty shallow and long. Continue using those rocky motions until I get up to this first crest that I'm putting in, in the farthest big wave. Here you can see me use my filbert brush to just kind of outline where I want that crest to be. This crest is still very small because it's the furthest away.
Once I blocked in that small crest, I went ahead and used a small filbert brush with some of that light blue color that I used for the moon glow and put in some highlights on those back waves under the moon, again using slight rocking motions. I found it's really easy to overdo highlights, so I always start with less than I think I need and add more later if I want to. So once I had those highlights under the moon, I started outlining the crest on the right side of that back wave using that same filbert brush as before. And for this, really it's just a slight downward stroke and then I start the foam line with the darkest part first. In this case, I use kind of a bluish purple for the shadow of that foam. outlining the middle of that wave. Same technique. Putting in where I wanted the crests or the top of the waves to be. Now we're going to start on the actual face of the wave. We made the crest. The water is going to be the darkest right underneath that crest. So I go ahead and I put in that darker color and then I work and poop my way down toward the back of the next wave. Once we get to this point where we're working on the face of the waves, we move from those horizontal strokes to more of a vertical swoopy motion.
here you can see me add some highlights to the tops of those crests on that back wave, that far back wave. I use a variety of blue colors when I'm making the face of these waves so that you can see some different distinct lines showing the way the water is moving. It also adds some complexity and just makes it pretty. Here you can see me connecting the very back of the middle wave to the second wave in front of it by swooping from the front of the back wave to where it touches the crest of the wave in front of it. I use a few different shades of blue when I'm making these lines to show some variation in colors in the water. So now I'm moving to that second wave. Once again, adding in the crests first and the outline of where I want the wave to be. As I work my way forward to the second wave, in the front you can see me starting to put in the crest of that wave there. I start with the darkest blue that I want for the crest of each wave. I've found that it's much easier for me to put in the shadow color first and then put the highlights on top rather than trying to put my light color and figure out where the dark color goes. It's just a lot easier for me to start with that darker color. Once I have the crest of the wave in place, I use a kind of old frayed filbert brush to put in the shadows of the foam. I found it to be a good brush to use for this because it gives it some random marks rather than trying to create some random marks using a really nice, perfect new brush. It just really makes it easier. These crests on the second wave can be larger and have more detail. 
On this second wave, I switched from using that filbert brush to using a dagger striper brush when I was working on these crests. When turned on its side, the dagger brush ended up making more concise marks than the filbert brush. Once again, connecting the waves, kind of that swooping diagonal motion from the front of that wave to where it meets the crest of the wave in front of it, the very top face of that back wave there. If you're painting a blue ocean like I am, a really good shadow color that you can use for underneath all of your highlights for your foams and your sprays is a purple color. Purple is a really good shadow color for blue. If you didn't want to use purple, you could probably use like a really grayed down blue or a darker blue than everything else, but I like using purple. Sometimes once I finish doing those swooping motions that connect the waves, I go back in underneath my foam line there, spray line, whatever you want to call it, and just kind of push back some of those foams just to make them look a little more random looking. Sometimes they can become too uniform. And it's really simple to just take your brush and just kind of dink and push it back there.
Here you can see me starting work on this front wave by once again placing in my crests. First I go ahead and I outline the wave. I'm using the dagger striper brush again. Once I kind of have my outline done there, you can see me swoop from the top of the crest downward using that dark blue shadow color. Really, it's not really a shadow color, it's the color of the water underneath the highlights. The biggest thing with making these waves look how they're supposed to is the direction of the brush strokes because the direction that you move the brush in shows the way the water is moving. want a nice clean line at the top of that crest. You don't want it to be super inconsistent. Because as the water kind of rolls over, it looks really smooth on top. So when I'm making these highlights on the crest, I get a little bit of that light color paint on the kind of the very side of my brush. And I just place my brush at the top of the crest and I use one stroke in the direction that I already laid down that back color. And just really light pressure, try to do one stroke down, then I reload my brush for the next stroke, and so on. What that does is it lets the lightest part of the crest be at that back line where you can just see it coming over the water. It naturally gets darker as you work your way down because you run out of paint on your brush. You don't want the highlight to go all the way down and cover all of that dark that you have going on. You really should leave a little bit of the dark blue at the bottom that you can still see after you put in the foam and the spray underneath the wave there. If you overdo it and you go too far down, you can take the dagger brush with some of that same dark blue color and just kind of blend it back up into the highlights. And then if you want it super smooth, you can even take a dry blender brush and blend those two edges together. Just depends on how rough and how smooth you want your wave to look. So here I'm starting glow of the wave by putting in a light green color in the barrel of the wave right there where it touches the crest and like the tallest face of the wave where the most of the light is going to be seen through the water. So what you want here when you're working on the glow of the wave you want to have your light color at the top inside the barrel and on the top of the wave, the highest point of the face. And you want it to slowly get darker as you go down the wave. And it should be the darkest underneath the crest because the water is covering the light. And so the water underneath the crest should be darker than the rest of the wave because there's just a lot more water that the light has to shine through. And when I'm making that, that glowing water there, I'm really smushing my paintbrush into the canvas. It's not very light pressure. I'm really pushing it in and blending it together. When you're painting the barrels of the wave and trying to figure out which direction the water should be going. I found it really useful to look at a reference picture just to make sure it looks right. For example, for this painting, the left part of this wave, I had kind of taken the shape of that wave from 
a portion of one of my reference pictures and then I had found some other waves that I liked from other reference pictures and just kind of smushed those together to make this nice long wave line. So here for these highlights of the foam, I'm using a filbert brush because it's a little bit rounded and it can make those nice foamy patterns. on the other side of this wave here starting with that light green color again and just doing the same process as before really smushing that light color into the canvas and then blend down into the rest of the water and I kind of transition from the light green to kind of like turquoise color back into that same blue for the ocean that I've been using pretty much the entire time you can see me start putting in some of those fine lines with that dagger brush that are inside the barrel. Those ones you want to be as thin as you can make them. And like I said, I relied heavily on some reference pictures while I was working with these, while I was doing these lines. The biggest thing is you want the lines to be really thin inside that barrel and on the face of the wave and then as you come down into the white water, the lines can get thicker and they can get a little bit more horizontal again. At this point, I discovered just how valuable the dagger striper brush can be. When I used it on its point, I could make really thin lines inside the barrel and the top face of the wave. As I worked my way down, I was able to turn it on its side to make those thicker, more horizontal lines as I worked my way to the white water and to the edge of the wave. Yeah, like I said, I really liked using my dagger brush when I was painting these waves. Like I said, I've tried before to just kind of put some random lines in there and sometimes they just don't look right. So using that reference picture really helps me.
sometimes when I'm making these white watermarks, it's helpful for me to start up here where the foam line is and then work my way backwards from there using those thicker lines. And then It also helps because you want the lightest part of the water right where the foam meet and the white water is. The wave's kind of churning, doing its thing. The lightest part of the white water is definitely going to be that foam line at the front, which is actually the wave kind of going back into the ocean. Not really the front of the wave, but whatever you want to call it, that foam line there. Here you can see me adding some highlights to the foam line to brighten it and add some texture. I used a small filbert brush for this. Something that can really make that foam line stand out and make it a little bit more three-dimensional is to go ahead and put a thin line of shadow directly underneath that foam line. I used that same dark purple color that I used for the shadow underneath the sea foam, the spray of the wave. 
And actually, to make that line as thin as I can, I go ahead and I thin out my paint with some paint thinner, make it pretty thin, like almost like ink consistency, so that it comes off the brush really easily and it can make a nice thin line. When I finished those highlights on the foam line, I also went through and added some more highlights in the white water, where I thought the most light would be hitting.
I did all this work and, and I got that wave in place and I was working on the shoreline up here and I tried so many different things. And the reason that I decided to stretch out the bottom of the white water there under the wave is because, for one thing, I thought there were parts in the wave that were just too short. They didn't go out far enough. And then the other reason was because I was kind of trying to squish that wave in there because I was trying to do all this really complicated stuff at the foreground of the canvas. I had seen some reference pictures where some other paintings where there's just so much going on, waves going this way and that. And I don't know, I tried doing some things and they just didn't look right to me. So instead of looking at paintings, I went ahead and I looked at some real photographs that people had taken of the ocean and I just kind of observed what was going on at the shoreline and what I noticed and what ultimately made me change my plan is that there was one wave coming in and one wave going out in most cases anyway. So I just decided to forego all that extra waves that I was trying to do down there. Instead concentrate on making one really nice big wave in the front there and then have some wet sand and some leftover sea foam that hadn't quite made it back into the ocean when the wave pulled back in. So anyway, so that's why I extended that wave. And here you can see the way I did that is I just went ahead and I put in my foam line again where I wanted it and then just worked backwards from there and just scraped out that last foam line just to get all of the bumps off of it, have it be nice and smooth. And I just went back through with that dark blue color and then just did that same process as before. Went ahead and putting in the white water where I thought it was necessary. Looking at my reference picture when I needed help with that. One of the rules that I have for myself when I'm painting is to always be open to making changes. So even sometimes when I really don't want to because I spend a lot of time on something and I'm just like, ugh, do I really need to, to change that or redo it? But at least so far, I have never regretted my choice to go ahead and change something if I didn't think it looked quite right. Because in the end, it produced a much better painting and I was happier with it. So I have a policy of always being ready to make changes.
here I have that bottom foreground wave changed. Finished making all the changes that I wanted to make and I'm much happier with how it's looking now. One of the biggest problems that I was running into was that my blue kept mixing in with the brown color that I had laid down for the sand and it was just turning into like a muddy green color. It's not what I was going for. So what I ended up doing is go ahead and painting that brown sand in some acrylic paint and letting it dry all the way 100% dry. I was able to keep that blue nice and bright and the way I wanted it to be. Now that the brown was nice and dry, I was finally able to go ahead and put in that wet sand without it getting green and muddy. So for the wet sand, I decided to use that dark blue that I used for the majority of the sky because that's what would be reflecting in the wet sand. So when I was painting the wet sand color with that with that dark blue, I was very sure to keep my lines horizontal and to keep some of that brown color showing through because you would be able to see some of that brown because the water is so shallow or even not there in some places. One of the biggest problems that I had for the wet sand is I was trying to make it have a shine and a glow. It's one of the things my sister-in-law really loved about some of the past paintings that I've done. But in the past, before this painting, the way that I had achieved that was always by following the Bob Ross method <laughs> of kind of pulling down some of that white color from the foam line, or in this case it was a really light blue, but by pulling down the color of the foam line with my brush and then kind of blending it side to side. And while I found that that works really well, you know, when I'm making reflections for lakes, I don't know, for some reason, when I was doing it this time, it didn't look right to me. So I once again went and I looked at pictures of shorelines and of glowing beaches and what they looked like in real life. And most of the ones I found were more of a horizontal glow and less of like that vertical blurry lines that I was making in my old method. For this reason, I decided to have the glow be directly under the moon and to use horizontal strokes rather than vertical strokes like I had done in previous paintings. Once I finished painting the blue of the wet sand, I went ahead and started working on the glow of the moon that I wanted to be reflecting underneath the moon. And to accomplish the look of that glow, all I did really was to put some of that light blue color that I used around the moon when I was making the glow in some horizontal strokes and then blended it outward with my blender brush. And I just kept doing that until I thought it looked bright enough and big enough for what I was trying to accomplish.
last lines that I did that really kind of show the lightest highlights on the wet sand there. I didn't blend those out as much, just so you could have some really distinct highlights there. When I was finished with making that glow of the moon on the sand, I had to go back through and redo the shadow underneath that foam line. It kind of got a little bit distorted as I was working. Laying in that shadow line under the foam is just one of the easiest things you can do. And it just makes it look so, it really makes it pop up. I like those things that take not too much work, but really make the painting better. lines that I'm making now, these kind of broken up sea foam lines, I decided to have them be broken up rather than more of like a solid line. Because when you see those foam on the beach that's left over, it's not a solid line. You know, there's little bits of foam here and there that are just still stuck on the sand. So once again, while I was working on this last little broken foam line. I had the lightest color be underneath the moon and just slowly got darker with that blue as I worked my way to the edges. I tried to follow that same process so it had some consistency and so that the light from the moon would be kind of one of the biggest things to note about the painting. I tried so many things before I found what worked for me. So really, you just have to experiment and see what works. It's one of the things that I really enjoy about painting. But it can be frustrating sometimes when you really want something to look a certain way and you just can't get it right, but get there eventually. And even when I finish Every time I finish a painting, even with all of that and, you know, I'm happy with how it looks and everything, I always, always, always find something that I would do different next time to make it a little better or just something to tweak. I don't know if that's just me or if every artist does that. That feeling really pushes me and, you know, makes me grow as an artist, so I don't mind most of the time.
you can see me just kind of going back through darkening some of the foam lines on these back waves on the right side of the painting. When I had done them the first time, I had left them a little too bright, so I just wanted to darken them a bit. the sand here, the dry sand, I had tried doing a bunch of little dots and I don't know, they just didn't look right to me. So I kind of went ahead and did these more horizontal strokes to make kind of like sand dunes almost. And it's a lot like the strokes that you do on the back waves on the horizon, except the ones on the ocean are longer and more flat. And also those ones, you kind of try to keep them like little smiley faces in the ocean. You know, you don't have any water that's like a little hill. They're all little dips. But here on the sand, it was actually beneficial to have some be more like little hills, little frowny face arches. Just to add some more random marks to the sand. Like I said before, one of the challenges I made for myself was to really focus on the light in this painting and where the light would be shining and where the brightest spots in the painting would be. So here I put the highlights of the sand once again underneath the moon area. And then worked my way to those darker browns on the edges.
just like that we have a finished painting. The last step of every painting is to seal it with a good varnish. You want to use a nice varnish to protect your painting from dust and other things getting on there. It also creates a really nice even finish across the entire painting. I use Gambar Gloss Varnish. I chose this varnish over others because it can be used sooner. You can apply it to your painting as soon as it is touch dry. The way you test to make sure your painting is touch dry is to take the tip of your fingernail and place it into the thickest part of your painting and as long as the painting does not move or bend, you're good to apply the varnish. For me, it ended up being about three weeks later. In the end, I was really happy with the finished painting. You know, of course, I was anxious to see what my sister-in-law thought of it. And when she came over, she couldn't have been more happy. So that is always a joy for me to see someone be happy with the art that I made for them. This was my first time making one of these in-depth videos. If you made it to the end, thank you so much for watching. If this video provided some value, I would really appreciate a like. Or if you have any suggestions on ways to improve, please let me know in the comments. I want these videos to be as helpful and enjoyable as possible, so any feedback is greatly appreciated. Here is the link to the playlist of my other in-depth lessons which will grow over time. And as always, thank you for watching.